Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. We have an extraordinary show for you this evening. NASA's Mike Menzel is here from the James Webb Telescope. And uh, it, it, boy, we are going to learn a ton, get to see some truly, truly amazing things. Now, I am especially excited tonight because I am just back from the Living Legends of Aviation event. And uh, uh, it, I'll tell you, it is such a wonderful opportunity to get out there and meet some of the most amazing people in aviation all together in one place, the people that really uh, make it what it is and, as the name says, are living legends. I want to show you uh, and give you just a little peek to uh, some of the people that uh, I was able to spend time with while I was out there. Um, here. Uh, first of all, I was out there with my good friend and living legend, Barry Schiff. And as you can see in this picture, I was here, we got to spend some time with Mike Kennedy, who's been on the show, and uh, Perry Coyne of Aspen, John Uzikai was there as well. And uh, also, uh, air crash, de crash detective extraordinaire, Greg Fyth, who will be on next week's show. He was also there, uh, but just some of the most amazing people on the planet. Major General Patrick Brady, uh, Chuck Aaron, um, who was actually out there, and uh, celebrities, of course, including Morgan Freeman, John Travolta, Prince Harry, uh, Kenny G, Kurt Russell. And uh, what really is the most important to me is the ability to meet some of you uh, who happen to be at the event. Uh, this is a picture with uh, Michael and Casey Rogers that were also there. Uh, it's just, it's just a, a ton of uh, fun and a wonderful opportunity. I, you know, we created this show to celebrate uh, some of the most inspiring people in all of aviation and space. And uh, it, this is just is such a, a great opportunity to get to meet and spend time with some of those. And uh, I'm glad I could just give you a, a small peek uh, into all of that. Tonight's broadcast is brought to us by Whip Air and their amazing Whipline Floats, who has been a very, very strong supporter of social flight. And uh, what you may not know, we've gone out there and visited Whip Air. They are full service. They're not just about flows. They are paint, interior, avionics, maintenance, and sales. And uh, here's something I found out today that I, I wasn't aware of, which is that in 2024, there's actually a bit of a crisis having to do with the amazing Cessna caravans where they're just not available. You just cannot get them and the market is extremely tight. And therefore, Whip Air is stepping up and offering their expertise in caravans to help out anyone who happens to be looking uh, for one of these amazing aircraft. So if that if you fit into that category, a uh, big thank you to Whip Air for supporting us and be sure to go check them out at whipair.com. One last thing, and that is we're in the last few days of Social Flight's Fly to Win Challenge. We're giving away a Lightspeed Delta Zulu headset on February 1st. Be sure to check that out. All you have to do is get the Social Flight mobile app for Apple or Android devices. Go and check in, and, uh, and then you can uh, uh, compete and possibly win that fantastic headset. Now... On to tonight's guest. Our recent Social Flight Live shows have progressed from the surface of the Earth into the air, into space, and now to the farthest reaches of the known universe. And it all culminates with tonight's guest. Michael Menzel is Mission Systems Engineer for the James Webb Space Telescope, which is currently operating a million miles away from Earth. It's gathering some of the most amazing images of the century and poised to change the way that we understand space. Mike has over 42 years of experience in the aerospace industry, including commercial and defense missions for NASA over the past 19 years. He's been involved in the James Webb Telescope Program since its pre-project phase back in 1998. I am thrilled to have him with us tonight. Please welcome to Social Flight Live, Mike Menzel. I'm going to bring him on the line right now. Hey, Mike, how are you doing? Good, Jeff. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you so, so much. You know, um, we spend so much time here on Social Flight Live talking about just, uh, you know, the aviation side, but so often we cross over where, um, you know, you have astronauts, you have other people that are involved in space exploration or mission specialists, and there's this continuum that goes from Earth into space and into the furthest reaches of it. And um, and I absolutely love what you're doing. I, I want to start with a small thing, which is just you you actually do have some connections 
in your own family to general aviation. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I do. My uh, my mother's father, uh, my uh, my grand my grandfather DeLeo, was a private pilot, and I've been flying with him since I was 11 years old. And uh, you know, being 11 years old and uh, flying in a Cherokee, where the, your grandfather would say take over, I'd be sitting. I couldn't see above the dashboard. Thank God for the artificial horizon, and the two minute turn indicator, because that's what I flew by. You but, started uh, I've been on with him since I was 11, and I love flying. I, I love that you started on instrument flying, like that was the way that you got going. <laughs> um, so let, let's talk for a minute about the, the mission of it. I think that there's, without understanding and putting in perspective what it is that, that, that we're doing with the James Webb Telescope, I want to bring up an image here that, uh, that to help illustrate and have you explain what does it mean? Because we're, I mean, when I think about telescopes, I think about distance, mm -hmm. but that's not necessarily, obviously, the way that we're looking at this. No, um, telescopes, as your eye, they're time machines. They see back in time. You're seeing the universe not as it is, but as it was. And the farther you look in, back in space, the farther back in time. For instance, if you go out tonight and you look at the moon, you're seeing it not as it is, but as it was, a second in the past, because it takes light a second to travel to you. If you look at the sun, you're seeing it as it was eight minutes in the past. And if you go out tonight and then see the stars, the ones you can see with your naked eye, are somewhere between four and 2,000 light years away. Now that means that some of these stars you're seeing as they were when the Roman Empire ruled the Western world. Galaxies are millions of light years away. So when we started the James Webb project, astronomers wanted the ultimate time machine. They, they wanted to say or see what's the, what's the first objects that turned on in the universe? What's the farthest things there are to see? And they nicknamed them the first light, the first stars and galaxies that turned on after the start of our universe, which is called the Big Bang, mm -hmm. which happened about 13.8 billion years ago. So that's what James Webb was built to do, to see the farthest objects there are to see. Wow, so I guess the, the, the flip side of looking at that means that when we look up, when we see things that, that are in this, in, at least certainly in the, in the furthest reaches, we actually don't know what's happening right now. That's correct. Uh, in fact, some of the stars that you, you see have uh, long since died in our present universe, they're not even there. So yeah, you're looking, you're looking at things that existed 13 billion years in the past. And to put that in perspective, the earth is about four and a half billion years old. So the, the, the very material that makes up the earth wasn't even there at the time. So you're, you're I, I mean, I, I certainly thought I had a grasp on some of this, but some of the points that you're making right now are a little bit mind blowing. You, when you look at the age of the earth, and the distance that you're seeing out there, that means that when you're looking even for planets, there may be planets that weren't that that exist now, but we can't tell because we're seeing stuff from before they were possibly formed. That's true in the early universe, but when we look for other uh, planets, we're looking around stars that are much, much closer. To our sun, we're looking for uh, for planets around stars that, instead of being billions of light years away, are more like 30, 40, 50 light years away. Got it. So that you know, so in cosmic time, 50 years in the past is really just a drop in the bucket, right? Right, right, right. You'd have to be looking much, much, much further out if you're talking about stuff like that. Then, right. So, um, in give me an idea. Looking at this uh, image that's up right now what type of a leap this current, the James Webb Telescope has made compared to things that we have had in the past, such as ground-based uh, uh, telescopes, and the best ones, and then Hubble? Well, Hubble, which, uh, which kind of held the record for a while, saw an object that astronomers were, were arguing is maybe about 13, uh, 13 billion years in the past, maybe around that ilk. And we think that stars were probably born, you know, about five, uh, 500 million years earlier. So Hubble cannot see that far in the past because it sees in the light that you and I see. 
-hmm. which is visible. And light from the very, very distant universe, the things that you know came right after the Big Bang, uh, that light, although it starts out its journey as blue light, by the time it gets to us, it's probably infrared light. So Hubble can't see that. And the reason for that is um, blue light, as it starts its journey, if you think of light as a wave, that wave, as it goes through a universe that has been expanding for 13 billion years, gets stretched out and pulled out so that almost like it's pulling a slinky. By the mm. time it gets to us, that short wavelength light is expanded into very long wavelength light, which is not light that we see. It's light that we feel as heat, infrared light. Wow. So it actually so Hubble really doesn't see that well in the infrared. And that's why we needed James Webb to see that far back in time. Got it. That makes that makes sense. That's uh, truly fascinating. So take take me back a little bit to some of the uh, earlier days when you you obviously, as we mentioned, started with that uh, on this project and it's pre uh, pre pre phase uh, to say in 1998. Um, what tell me a little bit about what got you know the momentum behind it and how its mission of what we were trying to accomplish coalesced. Well, astronomers wanted a, a telescope like James Webb almost uh, five years after Hubble was up there. <laughs> Hubble was up there in, in 1990. By 1995, astronomers were starting to get together. One of them, a Nobel laureate by the name of John Mather, was called into headquarters, and the uh, the head of astrophysics at the at the time said, "You know, hey, what's the next telescope going to look like?" So that they, they you know, talk to, uh, they convene some experts in astronomy, which they do every 10 years, by the way. They, they call the decadal survey. And they all agreed, hey, that next telescope, we want to be the ultimate time machine and we want it to be infrared. And we'd like it to be, at the time they said, bigger than four meters in diameter. Then all of a sudden they said, well, let's make it eight meters. And as, as you know, reality set in and cost set in and things like that, we, uh, we converged on a six-meter telescope. And is that all based on the, the engineering that's involved in trying to make something bigger and bigger and, and what the, the risks are or costs are to getting that out there? All of the above. <laughs> all, all of the above. I mean, you, you realize um, when we all converged, people wanted an eight-meter. and when, Even when we converged on a six-meter, you're talking about a telescope that's bigger in diameter than the rocket that's going to launch it. Now, that's an engineering nightmare because that means you're going to fold it up and unfold it in space. So I tell people, you know, we, we build a, a perfectly great telescope and we prove it works. We align it. It's a, it's a work of art. Then what, what, what do we do? We bust it up, fold it up, you know, package it like a transformer in a rocket. And then we have to unfold it in space. 50 of the most, you know, god-awful deployments ever conceived. And we have to literally rebuild that telescope on orbit and then realign it robotically, you know, from the Earth. And, it, you know, it was a feat of, of deployment and a feat of, uh, you know, the, the telescope team was, was magnificent in, in aligning that telescope and well, designing it and aligning it on orbit from a distance of, you know, at the time, was half a million miles out in space. Wow. Uh, so why don't you, I'll actually put up an image. Why don't you take us through a little bit of um, what the components are? Because there's a lot to this, and, and it feeds into the story of how complicated this was. Because it seems like the, the, like the James Webb Space Telescope was an order of magnitude more complicated than unfolding typical satellites or anything like that. Oh, it was it. It had 50 of the most complex deployments we've ever tried. And, you know, uh, what, what compounded that for us is it was going to be at a distance where astronauts could not fix it. Mm -hmm. So we had one chance at this. And if you look at that picture, the um, the 18 gold segments that you see there uh, is the uh, the primary mirror of the telescope. It stands about three stories tall. Uh, six uh, six meters in diameter, and it is the largest telescope ever put in space. Below that is a a sun shield that's about the size of a tennis court, and it keeps the telescope shaded from the sun. Now, it, to be an infrared telescope, 
an infrared telescope that sees the dimmest things there are to see. You have to be cold. The reason for that is, you know, if, if we turned out the lights and I put an infrared camera on you, you're, gl you're glowing in the dark. You're emitting a lot of light because you're 300 degrees, you know, your room temperature, 300 degrees Kelvin. Anything that's that warm will glow very brightly in the infrared. So you don't want your telescope glowing as bright or brighter than the very faint stars it's trying to see. Therefore, it has to be cold very cold, about 50 degrees above absolute zero. Now, you're not going to build a refrigerator to, to, to cool down three metric tons of telescope in space. So instead, you build this fancy umbrella, and you uh, keep the telescope in the shade of that umbrella, and it naturally cools down. And to put a, to, to put a, a context on how good that umbrella is, on the hot side of the sun shield, you have about 200,000 watts of power coming from the sun. We can only allow 0 0.02 watts to seep through. So I tell folks, if that sun shield were suntan lotion, it would have an SPF of 10 million. <laughs> and that's why we need five layers, about each layer the size of a tennis court, to shade our telescope. That's amazing. And, and it's, I love this image because it mm -hmm. demonstrates the size of this and going along with that is the complexity of how to make something like this happen so tell me uh tell me a little bit about that the steps of deployment like what what was what's in what was involved you know between turning this thing from a ball that that could fit inside a spacecraft to uh the massive object uh, and, and the tool that we have out in space a million miles away from us right now? Well, like I say, there were 50, 50 very complex deployments. Most of the, most of the hard ones were associated with the, with the sun shield that you see there. What happens is the, the sun shield is folded up almost like a, the layers are folded up almost like an accordion. We call it a Z-fold. And to unfold it, Two telescoping masts on each side of the telescope pull out. Well, well, uh, excuse me. First, let me back up. First, uh, when the uh, sun shield is folded up, it's folded up on two pallets, two plates that fold up in front and the front and back of the telescope. Those two plates fold down. Then, two booms on the sides of the spacecraft pull out, and they pull out the layer, the five layers that are folded on, you know, on top of each other. Okay, so now we have everything unfolded. Now a series of uh, complex pulleys and motors tightens each of the five layers to get it the right shape and the right position. Hmm. These deployments took about 14 days to get done. We did them very, very, you know, slowly, methodically, and carefully. But uh, the deployments involve about uh, the better part of 344 single point failure items. And a single point failure item is something that if it doesn't work, your mission is over. It's a it's mission failure. So we had a lot of mechanisms, a lot of release mechanisms, a lot of things that are holding these delicate membranes in place for launch. And if any of them don't release, it's a bad day. Well, you know, all 344 of them worked and we got them all deployed and uh it was a it was a magic moment for a lot of us when uh, when that last latch latched into place that is that it, it really is amazing that you could pull that off with that level of complexity but that's in itself still just the five layer sun shield now in addition to that or and it could have been before but tell me about the mirror the mirrors, uh, the, the deployment of the telescope was still risky, but uh, you know most of us knew it was a little less risky than the sun shield. Uh, the, the reason for that is the sun shield involves things that are floppity, they, they can snag. We, we, nick, we call them you know, un, undeterministic things. The telescope, <laughs> however, uh, involved rigid structure that would deploy out on hinges and lock into place, so it was rigid structure, that was great. That that made things a little easier, but after deploying, 
those tell the, the wings of the telescope and the secondary mirror that kind of folds down and locks on a tripod uh, have to deploy with some pretty good precision so that we're within what we call the capture range of our focus mechanisms, the things we use to align the telescopes. And as it turned out, you know, when, uh, when we unfolded the telescope, let the su secondary mirror tripod fold down and the two wings uh, fold out, everything latched into place just the way we wanted it to. And um, about, it took about a month or two. It took about a month or two for the telescope to cool down. And after it cooled down another month to, uh, to align the telescope with those 18 individual hexagonal segments that you see that all have to be lined up to act as one big mirror. And I remember uh, during the alignment process, our lead, uh, our, our lead uh, uh, telescope engineer, Lee Feinberg, he, he you know, I, I was sweating the, the big deployment. So everything deployed right now, it's Lee's turn. So Lee's sweating the, uh, the telescope alignment. And when he saw the first images, he kind of whispered to me, he goes, Mike, this damn thing's gonna work. It was, it was beautiful. Um, the, the, Im the first images that we saw, we thought would be much worse. And they were, they were pretty good. And over the next 30 days, Lee and his team focused that telescope and we had, uh, we had beautiful images. Wow. Um, well, it all started, I, I should have gone back with the launch. What, what what was involved in that or how that could have gone wrong to begin with how uh, tell me a little bit about about the launch well what could go wrong with the launch i mean you know, <laughs> i i think one reporter asked me uh do you like launches and i kind of snickered and said yeah i like them when they're done i love them when they're all done but uh the uh a couple of the subtle things that could go wrong launch vehicles have to aim at a certain place in space and their, their errors we call dispersions. And we carried fuel on board to, uh, to fix any errors that the Arian may have given us. Well, the Arian launch was as close to perfect as we'd ever want. Uh, Arian put us right on the money. And because they put us right on the money, um, we had extra fuel. So instead of 10 years worth of fuel, we have over 20 years worth of fuel. Wow. The Arian launch couldn't have been, we, we couldn't have asked for better. And um, everything about it was just, just perfect. So it was, a, it was a beautiful thing. Well, we'll talk about lifespan in a little bit, but that's, that's actually really impressive. And I never realized that there's a, a big connection between the initial deployment and the lifespan because it's the same fuel. And that makes sense. Right, right. Uh, uh, spacecraft carries fuel and they always carry enough to, to correct the dispersions, the errors that a launcher may give them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Arian told us what their dispersions were. We carried enough fuel for them, but man, we, uh, we didn't need it. They, they, the launch was as close to perfect as we would have wanted. Wow, well, let, let's talk about that distance and that location there. Um, because there's this interesting thing of this, this location, L2, and that you had to get to. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the point where it is and what part Arian did and what part you did through James Webb. Well, in the picture that you're showing, Arius, uh, Arian released us pretty much only a you know hundred miles or so, uh, maybe one or two hundred miles above the Earth. Okay, so on this picture we're really close, and Arian throws us out on a trajectory out to the L2 point, which is a million miles away from the Earth, four times farther than the Moon. And it's a point in space that follows the Earth around the sun. So the sun, the Earth, and the L2 are in a line. And the, the beauty of the L2 point, it's a place where the gravity of the sun and the gravity of the Earth combine in such a way that we can have a stable orbit around the sun that just follows the Earth around the sun. Mm. So at that, at that point, which we're not exact at that point, but J, uh, James Webb kind of orbits it a little. But at that point, the sun, the earth, and the moon are all on one side of the spacecraft. That means that the one umbrella can shade both the sun, the earth, and the moon. So all the three brightest things, the, th the things that could dump the most heat into us, mm -hmm. are on the one side of the umbrella, one umbrella shades all three. 
Wow. That's, it, that seems like a, a point uh, it's, that seems to be a pretty special point and, and an area that perhaps um, will be exploited for other things in the future. Is that kind of like a, a uh, an island out there, a location where, where, where you expect to see a lot of things happening? Well, a lot of future missions are going to go to the L2 point. I tell po folks it's our version of going out to the country to see the stars. <laughs> it's, a, it's a perfect point for space observatories and uh, the Roman Space Telescope that'll launch in 2026 is going there. And the telescope that we're building that you know some of us are hoping to build or start building for a launch in maybe 20, 30 years will also be going there. So astronomers are going to be using that that L2 point quite a lot. That's that's pretty wild. Now, um, tell me, what, obviously, when you look at this the sun shield and you think about what it function is, it 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 still seems like it's a fairly fragile structure. It, are are there things that that we have to worry about that you have to worry about? Um, that uh, happening or, or to it, even though it's all deployed, or, or are you in a fairly safe place? Well, as space goes, we're in a fairly space. Uh, we're in a fairly safe place, as space goes. <laughs> now we have a, we have a big mirror out there, and we have a sun shield that consists of five layers, each one either one or two mils thick. You know. Uh, micrometeoroids are hitting us all the time. We calculated that we'd be hit maybe twice a month on the mirror, about the same amount on the sun shield. And when it comes to the mirror, we can actually see the little, you know, the, the little imperfections caused by micrometeoroids. And, and they're occurring the way we thought they would. And the mirror is hmm. doing, you know, doing fine. It's, it's actually working twice as good, even after being up there for two years. But we are seeing micrometeoroids, and eventually, you know, micrometeoroids are putting little holes in the sun shield. But the way we calculated it, we don't think that a micrometeoroid will put a bullet hole through all five layers all in the same path. Hmm. We think that once it hits the outer part of the sun shield, you'll get a little mini explosion, and the debris might, you know, get to the next layer and maybe cause some, some smaller holes. And that might be the end of it. So slowly but surely, the mirror is experiencing some slight degradation because of micrometeoroids, and so is the sun shield. And also, the um, the radiation environment will start changing the material, the the properties of some of your materials. In particular, the blankets, the thermal blankets that you use mm -hmm. to control the heat of the observatory. And the the layers of the sun shield are themselves thermal blankets. Yeah. So, you know, as the uh, radiation environment of space changes them, we we are starting to see some slight degradation, but nothing that we didn't expect. Right. Right. That makes sense. Well, I mean, the big story, of course, uh, throughout James Webb and all these steps was what an incredible success it was that all those steps went as planned. But you're on the front lines and you are on the inside was it really uh, that good, or, or uh, are there some other things uh, uh, that uh, uh, maybe were a little bit nail biters or some other problems along the way? There was, uh, I mean, there was one day, uh, actually, I'll, I'll take back two days, but one day in particular, December 31st, 2021, where uh, we, we experienced our first real anomaly during the deployment. And that was, uh, that got everyone's attention. What happened is um, we well, we had to release 107 release mechanisms. Some of them released roll-up covers that were designed to unroll and get out of the way so we could pull out the, uh, the sun shield membranes. So when we fired the last, um, the, the last release mechanisms for the roll-up covers, we didn't get telemetry that said that the covers rolled up the way they should. Okay, so now it's go time. This is the, this is the nightmare we'd all, you know, for 20 years. We're like, uh oh, here here, here it is. We got to really think. And and you know the the team all the operations team kept their cool. The, the ops team was fantastic. Uh, it was led by you know a, a 
guy named Wallace Jackson. He, him and his team just did a phenomenal job. Oh, and, and, and Carl Starr, the mission operations manager. Everyone kept their cool. And what, what it turned out is we weren't sure whether the roll-up covers fell into place. But thank God, one of our thermal engineers, our lead thermal engineer, Perry Nolenberg, pointed out that, hey, um, one of the temperature sensors up at the top of the observatory went from hot to cold instantly. We started tracing it back, and he says, hey, the only way that could have been shadowed at that instant is if the roll-up covers went to exactly where they were supposed to. Mm. So within about an hour or so after our anomaly, and we're all, you know, the adrenaline's going nuts, we're all, we all settled down and go, oh, it's a faulty sensor reading. Got it. So, and then during the course of December 31st, we started noticing our batteries were, uh, were, were discharging a little, and that caused some concern. But once again, within one or two hours, we, we fixed it. But that was a long day. By the time we fixed everything and everything was settled, De December 31st turned into January 1st, 2022. And I think we all went home probably around two or three in the morning. And after that, things, the rest of the deployments went without anomaly. When did it, when did you get to the point that you could sleep through the night through this process? <laughs> um, about day, January 8th, January 8th, 2022 was when the last deployment locked into place. And that's where, you know, I was joking around with Lee Feinberg going, okay, Lee, I'm going to bed, have fun. <laughs> It's going to cool, take 30 days to cool down, and then your nightmare begins. Well, let's let's get to some of these images, and 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 I, I want to start learning what what we're already getting from the James Webb Space Telescope, and what it really means to all of us here. Um, and we've got a few uh, a, a few pictures, and of course, this is nothing compared to what else is actually out there, but. But talk us through a little bit about what, what you've seen, um, maybe some related to these pictures, maybe some just in general. Well, this was, this was my first favorite picture. Um, it's a picture of a, a cluster of galaxies that you see in, in, in right in the middle. As cosmic distances go, this cluster isn't all that far away, about 4 billion years <laughs> in the past. So the Earth is forming at about the time this, this thing is, is coming to, light is coming to us. But you notice these kind of curved streaks uh, centered around that. That big cluster of galaxies is so massive, the gravity is changing space and time. And the light that's coming through that bent space from galaxies much, much farther away is getting distorted in those arcs that you see. It's not only getting distorted, it's also getting magnified. So some of those arcs that you see coming there are from galaxies much, much farther away. Now, I like this picture. I saw this picture, uh, which we showed the President of the United States, uh, you know, a couple of days after. I, I got a sneak preview of this picture about two days before that. And I was standing with one of the project scientists, Eric Smith, and, and we all loved it. But when I turned to Eric, I, I said, what's the, what's the dimmest thing in that? It said another way, I said, what's the limiting magnitude, the dimmest thing in that when he told me I asked him, how long did it take? And he told me, and the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. Now, a couple days later, my wife looked at this picture. And my wife, with her keen eye for detail, says, it looks like Hubble. I said, yes, it does look like Hubble. Hubble took 14 days to take that picture. James Webb did it in 12 hours. And in 12 hours, we beat Hubble's record. And that, when I realized that, that's when the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. I turned to Eric, and I, I think I said, you know, you know, what's ever out there, we're going to see it. We built this thing to see the farthest things there are in the universe, and we did it. This was, this was a magic moment for me because, you know, as an engineer, I'm thinking our team, we did it. If we took that picture in 12 hours, whatever is out there in the distant universe, this telescope can see it. So, so this, that, this was one of my favorites. The, the, 
That's a really, really important concept uh, that, that lands very powerfully with me, and that is this idea we think of things in infinite terms, uh, you know, infinite universe, at least to a layman like, like myself. Um, but the idea that James Webb Telescope can see the farthest period of what exists in, in uh, of, of these uh, galaxies, stars, etc., that's earth shattering, you know, to me, that, that idea that you're reaching, you don't think about space as sort of you're reaching the end a little bit. Um, that's crazy. It should be, or it should be mind blowing to you. And it, it's mind blowing when you think that um, the theory of the big bang, I, I, I tell this to, I used to teach astronomy and I tell this to, to students, um, the, the, the concept that the universe had a start means that it's finite. At least it's finite in time. And you know, uh, back when 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 they started to come to this realization in the early 1900s, it was the first time in history that science actually started to predict or started to have theories that said the universe had a beginning. Prior to that, people had the notion that you just had that. Well, the universe is infinite, both in space and time. But now, uh, you know, the early 1900s, astronomers started to come to the conclusion that, hey, the cosmos itself had a beginning. And that is that is mind blowing. And, and because it has a beginning, we can talk, talk about, hey, we think we see the farthest things there are to see because we're seeing things that are so far back in time. They're they're close to the beginning of the universe. And you and and you kind of see what that it's blank beyond those in a way. Is that accurate? Well, what you'll see is that um, you won't. Uh, farther back than that, you don't see objects. You see the kind of um, I'll call it a homogeneous glow, and mm. that is actually the the homogeneous glow that they call the cosmic background, the cosmic microwave background, which you know, in reality is the surface of the explosion of the Big Bang. Mm. And one of my colleagues at NASA won a Nobel Prize for actually uh, making measurements of it and, and coming up with the evidence that said, yeah, the, the data fits the theory. That's, that's the Big Bang. So when I say you've seen the farthest things there are, I, I talk about the farthest stars and objects. We can see farther back in time than that, but farther back in time than that, you're seeing this homogeneous glow, right. uh, but you're not seeing structure. You're just seeing the, the, the primordial, you know, fireball. Right. Right. That makes sense. Does, does the fact that we can see uh, where that kind of transition occurs and that we can see it in these different directions mean that you can also sort of look the other way and triangulate where the center point of the starting point was? No, you're, you're okay. You're going to hate this answer. And I think most of your, most of your viewers are going to hate this answer because <laughs> all of us who live in a three dimensional universe hate this answer, but I'm going to give you the answer. There is no center of that explosion. The explosion is everywhere. No matter which way you look, you're seeing the fireball because it is space itself that has exploded and is expanding. Every place in the universe can be considered to be the center of that explosion. I don't expect, I don't expect any of you to like that answer, <laughs> but, 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 but my physics professors would say, yes, Menzel, Menzel said what we told him to say. So, and, and after 42 years of studying this, I actually believe what I just said. Yeah, that's going to take me some time to digest. I won't say I don't like it. I was just going to say that you're way ahead of me in being able to wrap my head around it because you look out there, you think in three dimensions, as you mentioned, and, and the, the natural thing is to say, well, we're not egocentric. It doesn't have to be the center from where we're looking. Where is the center? Where was it? Um, and the answer is nowhere and everywhere. Well, or everywhere. everywhere. Or everywhere. Or everywhere could be the center. That's absolutely fascinating. Okay, well, before my head explodes anymore, let's look at some things a little more um, tangible, perhaps? <laughs> yeah, th this one's a little easier. 
Um, these are uh, these are five galaxies called nicknamed Stefan's Quintet. Um, there are five galaxies in there, but four of them are actually interacting with each other, and they're actually colliding, and they'll they'll actually coalesce and probably into a bigger galaxy. And the mm. theories are that um, galaxies grow by eating each other up. Our own our own Milky Way galaxy will eventually collide with our nearest neighbor, the Andromeda galaxy, in a I think three or four billion years. Galaxies grow by 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 colliding with each other. There is a fifth galaxy in there, the one on the far left, that is just a photo bomber. He's just he's just hanging out there. He's not involved. <laughs> but the other galaxies are are actually uh, colliding with each other, coalescing. And when they do, um, the material in the galaxies actually gets kind of squished, which makes stars. You can see um, uh, some spirals in there that in the reddish color. Yeah, and that's those are areas of what astronomers call starbursts. Those are areas where new stars are being born because as the galaxies collide, they're kind of compressing their own material, their own gas. And when you start compressing them, that starts starburst. Is that like when, when we hear the term sometimes of like a, a nursery or something like that in, in space forming stars? That is correct. It, it, you could be looking at some of those starburst areas as what they call stellar nurseries. Wow. That's that's absolutely amazing. And is it only the non-astronomers out there that when you think about the time, uh, as you mentioned, how when you're looking back versus what's happening now, do, does the astronomy world and folks like yourself ever reflect back on what the current state is of something like that based on what you're seeing? Or is that really kind of irrelevant? What I mean by that is when you're looking out there at something like that, does it, is it, even curiosity-wise or even a little bit cool that there are some things you're looking at and you're saying, hey, I happen to know that right at this minute, these guys have already ex like exploded together or merged or eaten one another or any of those things? Well, the, the answer is yeah. Uh, that is considered. I mean, it, it, is, it is kind of mind-blowing even to, I'm not an astronomer, I'm just a, the engineer, but my degrees are in physics, so I can talk yeah, a yeah, but you bit taught it, it. <laughs> yeah, I did, um but um yeah it it does blow your mind a little, and we have computer models that's that will predict what these galaxies might look like if we could see them at this you know at as they are in this moment of time um and but even though we can't, what we can see are other galaxies that probably evolved around the same way these guys did, right? So what we'll do is that they'll take computer models and say, hey, how do these galaxies that are colliding, what would they look like in the future? And we'd say, oh, they look like this. And then we'd look at galaxies closer to us and say, hey, look, look, we see a galaxy that's pretty close to us, meaning it's fairly the same age as us, and look, it has this same shape that we predicted these colliding galaxies would have. Oh, mm. kind of makes us feel that we're on the right track. So yeah, different yeah, objects, but a different time frame. You're able to zoom right. by looking closer. You're looking at, you know, you're seeing something that time has gone past and seeing a, a comparison or, or something right. comparable to the, it. The, that the, the way the way I teach this is, um, if you, if you were an alien and you came to Earth and you saw a baby and an old man, right? Okay, and, and you, you wanna say, well, how does the baby turn into the old man? Well, what you would do is just sample a bunch of humans of different ages and say, oh, wait a minute, I think I can piece it together. The mm. baby will probably turn into a toddler, the toddler will turn into a, a, a child, the child will turn into a teenager, the teenager's parents will go nuts, <laughs> and the teenager will eventually turn into a decent human being and then an old man. <laughs> I love that. Well, let's look at another uh, absolutely iconic image. This one is a stellar nursery. Stars are being born here. And it was nicknamed the Cosmic Cliffs. This cloud of gas in space is about eight light years across, eight, eight or ten-ish. And it is in our own Milky Way galaxy. 
So this one is not millions of light years, hundreds of millions of light years away like that cluster was. This one's a couple thousand light years away, as is this one. This is the Eagle Nebula. And it was uh, made famous by Hubble, but we took the pictures. It was called the Pillars of Creation. And stars are being born in this one as well. Once again, that cloud is probably about 10-ish light years across. And if you look at uh, the picture that's in there, um, the blow up of it, you can see what uh, a lot of my colleagues nicknamed lava, that the deep red. Yeah. That deep red is a place where stars are being born right now. And we're seeing them through the, uh, the gas and the dust of that, of that stellar nursery. That's amazing and, and, and amazing how much more you're able to see uh, based on that. Tell me about this one. This is another stellar nursery. It is one of the closest ones to the, uh, uh, to the Earth. It's called uh, Rho Ophiuchi. And once again, stars are being born in here. And you can see uh, some of the phenomenon that's going on. There's some streaks of red in there. And those streaks are, are jets that seem to come out of young stars. And, and they're not exactly sure why um, the, the, the mechanism for that. And I'm, I'm far from uh, someone who can, who can talk about that other than to say that stars are being born in there. And we see the, uh, the evidence of those jets that are hmm. coming out in these new stars. It is a, uh, you mentioned like uh, we don't know a lot about some of these things. That, that seems to be a, a big part of what comes in terms of discoveries from something like the James Webb Telescope, that we start to see things that we can't yet explain, and that sets scientists off and astronomers off on and physicists on solving that and understanding more about our world. Yep, and that's the fun part of it. You know, I, I get asked a lot, what are the, what are the things you, you most hope for James Webb? I got asked that a lot before the launch and even after, and I told him, well, uh, you know, there are three things that I want. I want to be able to say that we saw the very first stars that turned on in the universe, very first galaxies. I, I want to be able to say that. I would like to be able to say that James Webb actually determined the first biomarkers on an exoplanet, mm. the first evidence, you know, good evidence that there's life out there. I'd like to say that. But the third thing I tell folks is I hope we see something that no one ever dreamed to ask. Most of the space telescopes that are up there, most of the ones that are, you know, that uh, go far beyond the capabilities of their predecessors, all come up with discoveries that no one ever thought of. And that's the third thing that I wish, you know, for, for James Webb, that we see something that no one, no one saw coming. Wow. It's interesting to me, the idea that, when, I mean, when you think about discovery as a concept, I think uh, it's easy to look at it in a very concrete sense and say you discover as in you see something and you're like, hey, I just, I know what it is. I see it and I didn't know it existed there before. That seems different than the idea that James Webb is seeing and bringing back images that are asking new questions, that are saying, here are all these things we have no idea about. Go forth and start trying to figure it out. That's what makes science fun, isn't it? Abs absolutely. You know, it's, it's, it, it's one thing and it's a little less exciting to sit there and say, oh yeah, we spotted a planet. We know exactly what a planet looks like and we can tell you what's on that planet. Then to sit here and go, we saw these jets coming out of this and we have no idea why. You know, I joke around my, my colleagues that are scientists saying that's the difference between science and engineering. If an engineer says, I don't know what's going on, that ain't a fun day. But if scientists <laughs> say it, it's cool. <laughs> Exactly. That that definitely makes makes sense. Here, as we as we get a little closer to to Earth, um, of course, this is very cool stuff. This I told you that first photo, uh, the first image was my one of my one of my favorites. This is my other favorite. Um, the the shortly after this came out, well, I, I tell two stories. First, when I was 11 years old, I I got my first telescope. I brought it out at night. My parents let me take it out at three in the morning in Elizabeth, New Jersey. Now, I don't know if you know what walks around, 
the streets on Elizabeth, New Jersey, but I assure you it's not the stuff of Norman Rockwell paintings. <laughs> so I'm out there with my telescope. I'm 11 years old. Some, some hoods come by. They must be 19, 20. And, and they, they started yelling, hey, Galileo, what are you looking at? I invited them in the backyard. Saturn was out, and I showed them Saturn. And they, they, they stayed with me for an hour. Now, if my mother looked out the window and saw me surrounded by about, you know, five or six 19-year-olds, she would have had an aneurysm. But they were, they were overwhelmed by what they were seeing. Saturn through a telescope is incredible. Now, when we saw this picture, which is Neptune, which has pathetically small rings, right, in the visible, I saw the picture and I, was, I walked out of my office. I'm yelling down the hall to some of my friends. Uh, Paul Geithner, the deputy project manager on the, I'm like, Paul, Paul, you got to get in here. Look at this. Oh my God, look at what we're seeing. Oh, this is so neat. And while I'm yelling it, you know, having a fit, all of a sudden I'm having deja vu and I realize it's the same thing my hoodlum friends were saying 50 years ago in my backyard at Saturn. You know, the sense of awe that you get when you see something like this for the first time, it can overwhelm you. I mean, you know, and so when I saw the, the Neptune here, I had a very visceral reaction. I started calling my friends saying, look at this. That's Neptune. It's not Saturn. It's Neptune. And, you know, it just harkened back to this incident that happened 50, 50 odd years ago in my backyard with a bunch of, uh, I don't know what the hell they were <laughs> doing, but believe me, they were up to no good. <laughs> Until you handed them a, put them in front of a telescope. <laughs> I love that. And they stayed, uh, believe me, they wanted, they did not want to leave. They had a, they had a ball. Wow. Well, here's another picture you're not going to see in your backyard. <laughs> Uranus. And uh, this one ha was a kind of neat because uh, my bachelor's thesis advisor at MIT was the astronomer that discovered the rings around Uranus. His name was Jim Elliott. And uh, once again, the rings around Uranus in um, invisible light, they don't show up. The way, the way uh, Dr. Elliott found them was he saw a star that was being eclipsed by the planet Uranus. And right before the planet blotted out the star, he noticed the starlight dip once, twice, five times before the planet blocked it out. And there's a transcript of him, him and the, the, his colleagues said, oh, I think we know what's going on. If we see the same dips on the other side of the planet, we got rings. Wow. And that was, I think, uh, Jim might have discovered that in 77, something around that time. So we knew, once again, we knew Uranus had rings, but you can't see them in the visible. But look at them there. They're, you know, God, they're beautiful. That is amazing. And, and, and the others are, are moons of it? That's correct. Yep. All the, uh, all the major planets, the, the giant planets, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, they, they all have rings and they all have, uh, have you know, Saturn and Jupiter have hundreds of moons. They, with, with a, you stare at them long enough, you'll find more for all these, all these gas giants. Wow. And there's there's my backyard favorite. <laughs> One of the best pictures that 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 you can imagine of that. Um, what because we can see things that are also in our own uh, in our own backyard. Do you expect there to be discoveries both in the very very distant? Um, uh, you know, past and and distance that we're looking, as well as in as closer to home. Oh yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Matter of fact, um, uh, you know, I am a, a a kind of avid, or I used to be an avid amateur astronomer. Now that Webb's working, I can get back to that. Uh, amateur astronomers these days are are contributing a lot to uh, to professional astronomers. Of course, you know, within our own Milky Way, or within the galaxies close to it. And, and, and they're making new discoveries and new things to look at, you know, almost every day. Um, one of my favorites, uh, there's, uh, there's a star that will probably be going nova either this year or the next year, T. Corona Borealis. It goes nova, I think, every 70 years, and its time is up. Uh, so if, if 
you're a, you're an amateur. We have amateur astronomers looking all over the world, waiting for this nova to to explode. Wow. And and I'll tell you, once it once it does, I I hope that some astronomer turns web to it. I'm sure they will. But there's there's a lot in our own cosmic backyard that uh, amateurs can contribute to in their own you know in their own backyard. Are there other uh, really notable um, discoveries that in such a, in this short time that that uh, the James Webb Space Telescope has been operative operating um, that that have already come out that are already things that are that are really people are turning on. You know, it, it would be uh, it would be better for my science colleagues to say this, but I can tell you what they told me that that has been in the literature. It turns out that when we're looking at galaxies in our early universe, it appears that they are are bigger mm -hmm. and um, more evolved than we thought they were hmm. would be, which means that uh, galaxy growth and galaxy evolution seems to be happening quicker than we had thought in the early universe. Wow. And, um, you know, the, the astronomers, uh, my, my colleagues are telling me, hey, this is, um, this is something that's interesting. They've also told me that, hey, some of the papers have been blowing this a little out of proportion. I've seen papers that said, uh, oh, um, our theories are all wrong. No, no, they're not all wrong. But this was an unexpected, uh, unexpected finding. And I think that as we look deeper into the universe, which Webb will do, I'm expecting to see, you know, I'm hoping and expecting to see some surprises. Yeah. I think we're just starting to get the tip of the iceberg of our surprises. Wow. And, and the good news is, of course, that we have, as you mentioned in the beginning, a, a, a longer horizon to expect to continue to have the benefits of it. As, as I understand it, we were, it was sort of kind of designed and guaranteed for five years, but fuel for 10. And now, due to circumstances, fuel for 20? Well, fuel for 20, but I, I want to keep expectations reasonable. You know, <laughs> that means that uh, what, 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 I, what an engineer like me means by that is, well, it won't be fuel that will limit our life. You know, right. there's plenty of other things in outer space that can limit your life. And, um, well, that's but, true. But there's, you know, there's no reason to believe right now that we're not going to make 10 years and beyond. Right. But, you know, the, 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 way, the, the way reality works out there is, hey, eventually stuff starts failing on its own. And if you ask me, you know, the way it, it will most likely go is we have four science instruments that are working. After, you know, 10 years, maybe we'll have two or three. After right. 15 years, maybe two. All right. signs right now, you know, go to our, hey, it will be a graceful degradation that will, uh, will you know, happen well after it's engineered life. So, but, That's so, you know, so I, cool. I, I told you uh, the other day, I don't like quoting serious movies, but I did like a quote from the movie The Martian. Space does not cooperate. <laughs> and I think that, I think that's true. Yes, definitely. Well. Um, I guess the last thing is what what's next? Uh, not just uh, uh, James Webb, but beyond that, uh, where um, uh, you know the, where do we start looking for things like I believe you uh, you may have mentioned uh, habitable worlds, things like that. Yeah. Um, well, first the Roman Space Telescope, which is about the size of the Hubble Space Telescope, but will have a much much broader field of view. That's going to be launching in 2026, so that that will be one of our next great observatories. And then um, my colleagues and I are starting to do what I call cartoon engineering, just to chart out some things and do some uh, map out some trade studies to to do the next telescope, which will be uh, a telescope whose primary mission, one of its primary missions, will be to uh, uh, find habitable worlds around other stars, Earth-like planets around other stars. And we're hoping that it will not only do that, but it will serve as a, a general uh, astrophysical observatory to, to go beyond what Hubble's doing and what James Webb's doing. It will probably be uh, a visible telescope, visible in ultraviolet, working in the same uh, wave bands, the same light as, uh, as Hubble. But uh, you're talking to a, to one 
one engineer who wants to make it bigger than James Webb. Yes, and and you have been there since James Webb was a sketch on a piece of paper. So um, you've been through that process before, and so my money is that the ideas that you guys are throwing around right now will will be in space at some point in the future that we'll get to see. I I, I hope that I'll get to see it. I doubt that I'm going to be the uh, mission systems engineer who finishes <laughs> this one, but I, uh, I I can see that there's a number of, of uh, men and women who are chomping at the bit to do it, and I know they're capable. And I'm I look forward to uh, instead of being in a mission control center, watching my TV on the next launch, and wishing them the best. And 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 especially when you talk about this L2 point a million miles away that has so many benefits to being there. It sounds like uh, the future for that area also. We talk about um, uh, uh, manned or robotic uh, missions being on, on the moon, on Mars. Mm -hmm. It sounds like this might be a point in space that we start to see a little community around. Do you, you see that? Well, yes, beyond a shadow of a doubt. But uh, And people get a, a little bit of a um, misinterpretation of this. The orbit around the L2 point, if is awful big. I've actually had to talk to some reporters that were wondering whether it could get crowded, and I assured them, no, <laughs> there is no, uh, there, there, there's no chance of us getting getting in collisions and getting crowded. And I can prove that because any engineer that tells you that, oh, I think these will collide, ask that same engineer. Well, if I gave you the requirement to make a collision, you tell me it was impossible, <laughs> and and they do so. So yeah, there's a community of it, but I wouldn't worry about uh, you know air traffic control out there. <laughs> perfect, 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 perfect. Well, um, uh, Mike, I, I just want to say thank you so much for taking your time to join us this evening here on Social Flight Live. It is fascinating to me. It's a bit of a departure for us to be able to go from uh, the terrestrial aviation out into space and and beyond, and uh, it's just fascinating things that you're doing and I am grateful for the work of you and your colleagues at NASA and everything that they're doing to further uh, aerospace and exploration it, it it this is truly some some fantastic stuff well the taxpayers paid for it so congratulations to us all and thank you for having me <laughs> absolutely well have a wonderful evening Mike thank you you too thanks good night and thanks to all of you for taking time out of your evening to join us here on Social Flight Live. We'll be back again next week here back on Earth talking about air safety. We are going to have flight safety detectives Greg Fife here on the show. And uh, unfortunately, there have been quite a few incidents and accidents happening that uh, will give Greg more than enough uh, to talk about as we ask him about that. And uh, I cannot wait to have him here on the show. If you have your own kind of ideas of things that you would uh, uh, like to make sure that we uh, that we chat with him about, just uh, send a message to info at socialflight.com and we'll, we'll try to include that as much as that we can. Then um, we're off for a week and back on Tuesday, February 13th with Kurt Robinson, CEO of Robinson Helicopter. Uh, arguably the most prolific uh, uh, aircraft uh, helicopter company uh, going, and, and their story is truly fantastic and one of a family-owned business. So cannot wait for that to happen. And again, thank you all for all that you do to support General Aviation and for tuning in here on Social Flight Live. And I wish you all blue skies.